All right. <laughs> okay, everyone. Hello, hello. Okay. Very sorry for the uh, technical issues. Um, and we should be back live on the air. So hopefully everybody will rejoin us for our stream tonight. Sorry again for the technical issues, but we are back live. Uh, and we are going to jump into tonight's stream right after I email a link to my grandmother so she can watch. All right, everyone. Okay, great. We're getting people back in. Hopefully our stream holds together and we're going to jump in. Um, all right. Uh, well, welcome to uh, the real live stream tonight. Uh, I am the Planetary Manager Patrick Hess at Union Station, and I'm so glad to see everybody on this lovely March uh, evening. Uh, I was starting to think it, it was going to be springtime, but just like the Midwest always does, it pulls the rug out from under us, and it is a chilly March day. But hopefully where you're at is a lot more comfortable just making sure, yep, yeah. all right, awesome, we are still live. Okay, I'm pulling up my comments sheet here. Um, so thank you all for tuning in tonight. Sorry again for the technical difficulties, um, but welcome to tonight's What's Up live stream. We're gonna be covering a number of different topics all about what is going on in space and our night sky. We're gonna start with a, a star tour, looking at uh, what's coming up in our spring night skies. Uh, and then we are going to dive a little bit into what's been going on in the world of space exploration and astronomy discoveries. We'll touch on some good uh, news tidbits that have popped up over the past month. Um, so uh, just for anyone who's tuned in late, I am your planetarium manager, uh, whoop, Patrick Hess, and my title card is not popping up, um, but you'll have to take my word for it. <laughs> and um, uh, I want to thank our supporting sponsor, MRI Global, for keeping these live streams going and supporting us through any technical details that may pop up. And um, we are going to uh, jump into uh, tonight's stream. Uh, this is our 80th live stream. Can you believe it? Um, thank you all uh, for tuning in for uh, our first time watchers. Welcome. So glad you're joining us. Um, you can find all of our past live streams, all 79 of them, at youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. Um, I've got curated playlists of all the cool deep dive topics we've covered, um, all sorts of things. You'll have to check that out for sure. And for our longtime watchers, thanks for supporting us for the past two years. Um, we are just about at our second anniversary. Can you believe it? Um, and this is a live stream. It is 6 p.m. on March 7th. So if you're watching live, let us know in the comments. I've already seen seeing some people tuning in in the comments section. We've got a, a, one of our longtime watchers. I recognize this person. Um, and yo, what's up, Patrick? And I got to ask, uh, because I want to make sure I'm getting your name right, um, but uh, I, is it Trace? Because I know you've been watching for a long time, but it's Trace. Let me know if it's not. Let me know as well, and I'll be sure to get that right. But thank you for uh, watching, even if I've messed up your name all those times. Judy is tuning in, saying great. I'm glad you stuck with us for the technical technical difficulties, Judy. Thanks for watching. We've got Smarl saying hello from South Carolina. Thank you so much for watching. RY says, hey, from Kansas, with a couple Kansas-themed emojis. Oh, wow, you really went to town there with the ruby slipper and uh, a deer, I guess, and a rainbow. Love rainbows. Uh, we've got Ruth uh, tuning in saying, Jamie and Ruth say, hey, looking forward to the program. Thanks for watching, Ruth and Jamie. So glad you're watching tonight. Um, everybody uh, uh, chime in with any comments or questions you have throughout the stream. Let us know where you're watching from. That's always a good time as well. Like Stephen, who's tuning in from St. Joe. Thanks for watching tonight, Stephen. All right. So we uh, hopefully will stay steady with our uh, technical details um, uh, and uh, issues that we've had before. Keep the comments coming, everyone. But we're going to jump in. And uh, as I mentioned, we're coming up on our second anniversary next month, and we'll definitely celebrate that uh, as we roll around. We've had over 315,000 views on our live streams for the past two years, which is incredible. I'm so, so thankful for all the support you've provided uh, over the past 24 months. Uh, stay tuned for exciting plans as we continue to move forward. For now, we're going to keep our monthly streams going because we've got a lot of people watching and uh, enjoying. Uh, like Paul saying hi again. We're so happy to see you again. Thanks for watching, Paul. So glad you're tuning in again. Uh, and then uh, Trace, uh, yes, that is how to say your name. Perfect. Well, I'm so glad I didn't mess that up. Well, thanks so much for watching, Trace. Hannah saying, uh, Hannah and Olivia are watching from Olathe. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, Misty says hello. And Eric says howdy from New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Uh, thanks for watching, Eric. And I sure wish I was in Florida with you. Uh, Emily's watching as well, says happy 80th show. Thanks so much, Emily. 
Glad you're tuning in. And we've got Chapri saying, hey, from Kansas. Keep the comments coming. We'll put a pin in these. Uh, and uh, we will uh, jump right in. Um, and got a couple of little announcements about the planetarium. Uh, planetarium is open to the public right now, six days a week, closed on Mondays for maintenance. Um, and don't forget to check out our new projectors last, installed last fall. They are uh, laser projectors um, with uh, amazing brightness and clarity. So if you can come to the planetarium in the past but haven't been recently, definitely come and stop by. Um, uh, exciting, though, our uh, sister theater, uh, the Extreme Screen Theater, um, has just upgraded its projectors as well. It's jumping on the laser bandwagon, so check out uh, the Extreme Screen uh, Theater, which uh, is um, a really, really cool IMAX theater. It is a very tall theater. Um, it, uh, In fact, um, there's a, a... How big is the Extreme Screen Theater? I wanted to bring up a little bit math uh, of math. Uh, because the Extreme Screen Theater is 80 feet by 53 feet. That's five stories tall. Uh, what's that surface area? Well, we can do a little math, and that is 4,240 square feet for that giant screen. Uh, if you're wondering, this is this is Math Corner. hope you guys are okay uh, derailing things a bit into some math, but you may wonder how big the surface area of the planetarium is. Well, the planetarium is a big dome. It's not a full dome. It's actually truncated, so it's 167 degrees, um, and so there's a bit of an angle from where the center of the sphere would be, and there's a fancy formula to calculate that, and I've uh, taken the liberty of done some math for you. First, we need to figure out how tall the dome is, and we need that angle up to the edge of the dome, which we call the spring line. That's an architectural term. The radius is 30 feet. Um, that is the radius of the sphere of our dome. We can do a little trigonometry to calculate um, the height from the edge of the spring line up to the top of the dome. And doing the math, that's 26.6 feet from the bottom of the planetarium dome to the top. So if you plug that into our formula, uh, with a little pie thrown in for good measure, we find that the planetarium has a surface area of, interesting, 5,014 feet. Hmm, a little bit, uh, uh, dare I say, a little bit larger than uh, the extreme screen. Hmm, the biggest screen in the region, eh? I'm not salty about that at all. Uh, but the extreme screen is still amazing, even if it's not technically the biggest screen. Maybe it's the biggest movie screen. How's that? Uh, hopefully my marketing department feels okay about that little math diversion. Um, but check out the extreme screen. I just saw Batman there, and it was amazing. Um, Planetarium is open, and we're going to continue our uh, schedule uh, through the spring. We've got a couple cool shows popping up. We've got Dinosaurs at Dusk returning to the schedule and Capcom Go, which is a documentary about the Apollo program. So definitely come check that out again. Planetarium is open uh, six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday, and you can come see me presenting a star tour or any of our other amazing educators as well, plus other documentary features and kids shows. But for now, we're going to jump into tonight's stream with a preview of our spring night sky. Uh, but first, we're going to jump over to the comments. If you've tuned in late, this is a live stream on Monday night, March 7th, and uh, you're watching um, Planetarium Patrick. That is me, Patrick S., Planetarium Manager. Uh, and uh, let us know where you're watching from and if you have any questions throughout tonight's stream. Um, uh, we've got uh, Angela saying hi from the Space Coast. Awesome, Angela. Thanks for watching. Hannah's chiming in with some space-themed emojis. Thanks for watching. Hannah Laurie says, watching from Grain Valley. And Rachel says, greetings from Leavenworth. Greetings from Leavenworth. And Judy is watching from Casey Mo, north of the river. Awesome. All right. Oh, and Linda says, hello, Patrick and everyone. It's Belt, Missouri in the house. Awesome, Linda. Thanks for representing. Okay, so we are going to jump into tonight's star tour. We're going to do a little preview of our spring night sky. And as the days finally get longer, uh, you can see that our view of the skyline here in Kansas City now has the sun in it. If you'll recall last month and a few months before, uh, we uh, the sun had already set by the time our star tour started. But finally, the sun is still out. And we're looking out over the Kansas City skyline. Uh, if, let me know if you know where we're going from before I turn things around, where this uh, viewpoint is. Um, we've got Tammy, by the way, in the comments, one of our longtime watchers and super fans, uh, who says, hello. Thanks so much for watching. 80 streams, Tammy. Uh, can you believe we've been doing it this long? That is amazing. And I'm so glad you've been along for the ride as well. And KJ says, watching from Oregon, Wisconsin. Awesome. Well, thanks for watching, KJ. All right. So, of course, 
Uh, our daytime star, the sun, is still out, although right now you can see the moon up there. Let's uh, just zoom in on that moon. Uh, the moon tonight is in a waxing crescent phase. Waxing means that the moon is currently getting more full, bigger and brighter. A uh, crescent, you can see it's less than half full. But it is bright enough that you might see it during sunset tonight. Um, a lot of people get confused about seeing the moon when the sun is out, but the moon is going around the Earth at its own pace once every 29-ish days. Um, so sometimes we see the moon in the daytime, and that's okay. Uh, Eric is asking, will, when will you rework the Star Tour for the spring? Uh, that's a great question, Eric. So uh, tonight's a live stream, we're going to do a little preview of the spring night sky. But if you want to come to the planetarium and see an even cooler uh, view of our night sky, uh, you can stop by any time and it's always different because the night sky is constantly changing. Uh, but if you come back every two or three months, you'll see a big, view, different, uh, big difference in a view of the night sky with different objects and constellations. So we're going to fast forward a little bit here to get rid of that sun and bring out some stars. Uh, and there we go. So the sun has set. Uh, and yeah, we're going to spend our star tour at about uh, 7.30 p.m. tonight. That'll be about an hour after sunset. And we'll be able to see the stars a little bit better. Uh, by the way, Misty is saying, hi, Patrick. Are you the manager of the planetarium? I am, Misty. I manage the programs and technology in the planetarium, and I get uh, the pleasure of leading uh, a tour, or, uh, sorry, a small group of the uh, Science City team on giving star tours and things like that. So when you come to the planetarium, you'll see a number of amazing educators in addition to myself presenting tours. Uh, and Michelle is also saying howdy from Liberty, Missouri. Thanks for watching, Michelle. All right, so facing towards the north, we can see a few familiar patterns. Uh, I don't think I've mentioned these in a little while, so we'll start with these. But we've got the dippers, with the big dipper and the little dipper. These bright spoon shapes you can see in the northern sky all year long. Uh, right now in the springtime, they're kind of towards the horizon. And these two constellations belong to um, a, a set of... Or these two patterns, rather, so the dippers are not official constellations, but... The constellations that use these stars are, uh, oops, let's uh, want to just see this one. Nope. Oh. <laughs> We're having all sorts of technical difficulties. Uh, yep. Yeah. No. There we go. That's what I wanted. <laughs> all right. So the dippers here, um, you can see the big dipper shape and the little dipper. They are part of two constellations called Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Uh, and again, we can see these year round, but they are a familiar sight and a, a good starting point since they are so familiar. Uh, but these two patterns um, are most notable uh, in mythology for a story in Roman mythology. Um, the story goes that Jupiter, who was the king of the Roman gods, fell in love with a mortal woman named Callisto. Uh, and when Jupiter's goddess wife Juno found, about, uh, found out about his love, she became very jealous, so she turned beautiful Callisto into a bear so that she'd no longer attract Jupiter. Uh, later on, Callisto's son Arcus was hunting in the forest and found his mother and almost accidentally shot her with his bow, but at the last second, to save her, Jupiter turned Arcus into a bear as well, and then he grabbed them both by the tails and threw them into the stars so they'd be safe together forever. And he threw them with such force that their tails stretched out, that's why the bears have long tails. All right, so we are going to move over setting in the west in the springtime. We have a pair of constellations. This one looks like a bright uh, W shape. And next to it is sort of house-shaped constellation. This is Cassiopeia, and the house shape is Cepheus. Cepheus and Cassiopeia were the king and queen of an ancient African nation. Uh, they're famous because Cassiopeia was very beautiful. Uh, as you can see, she's looking at herself in the mirror there, but she was also very vain. She liked to look at herself in the mirror a little bit too much. And one day Cassiopeia boasted that she was more beautiful than the daughters of Poseidon, the god of the sea. And when Poseidon heard about that, he was very unhappy. Um, so he cursed their land with years of flooding, which washed away many of their crops and set their kingdom into a terrible famine. And in order to appease the god Poseidon, Cepheus and Cassiopeia tied their daughter Andromeda to some rocks by the ocean, ocean so Andromeda could be eaten by Cetus, a giant sea monster, and one of Poseidon's other children. Luckily for Andromeda, though, she was rescued by the great hero Perseus. We've got Linda chiming in in the comments asking, what is the star that is out before the sun in the east? Um, and I, I'm guessing you're talking about before sunrise in the east. 
Uh, and that's a great question. That kind of brings me to one point I wanted to touch on because we're going to be looking at some stars and constellations today. But what we won't be looking at during tonight's early evening star tour are planets. Now, planets can be visible in our night sky, um, but because planets orbit the sun at their own pace, uh, they are always in different spots in the sky. And right now, they all happen to be uh, later uh, in the evening or even in the early morning sky. So the early evening sky, we're not going to see them. But because as the Earth rotates, our view of the night sky changes. You can see my clock going by here as I fast forward time. You'll see different things in the sky at different times of the night. And that includes planets. So if we fast forward here, um, let's... Uh, label the planets and uh, one thing I wanted to do is um, we've got our Kansas City skyline here but I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a lower skyline uh, so we can see the horizon a little bit more clearly so if we look towards the east we're fast forwarding now we're at 4 a.m. Um, and the Sun will be rising soon and Belinda what you're seeing before the Sun rises is Venus Venus is uh, right now, the Morning Star. Now, Venus, of course, is a planet. It's not a star, but its nickname is the Morning Star and sometimes the Evening Star. Uh, Venus will always appear right at sunrise or sunset, depending on the time of the year. But right now, Venus is appearing in the early morning sky, shining very brightly. It's right next to Mars as well, which you may be able to see. Now, you can tell that these are planets because they do not twinkle, unlike stars. Stars twinkle because they're really far away from Earth, and only a tiny amount of their light actually makes it back to Earth. And that little bit of light gets disrupted by our atmosphere. And you can see even here in our virtual planetarium, the stars are twinkling. But planets are a lot closer than distant stars, so they do not twinkle. So, Linda, in the early morning, if you're up before sunrise, that bright point of light, take a look at it. And if it's not twinkling, then you can bet that that is Venus. Now, thanks for asking about that, Linda. So, unfortunately, in our early evening uh, star tour, we will not have any planets to see. We're going to rewind back to around 7.30 and whoops uh <laughs> let's get this back all right okay so here we are for our current star tour oops oh, got a little constellation poking out up there <laughs> all right so uh we've got another question from eric Eric says, in the past shows you mentioned, in past shows you've mentioned that the constellations will be changing as the stars continue to move. Most of the constellations were identified a thousand or more years ago. How different were they uh, when they were named relative to what we see today? That's a great question, Eric. So he's asking um, that the uh, I mentioned before that the stars move, um, and so constellations will change change shapes too. Um, so uh, what he's talking about is something called proper motion. So the stars we see in our night sky are our neighbor stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And all the stars in our galaxy are orbiting a center point, And that means they're moving, but they move very slowly. It takes hundreds of thousands of years for a star to go all the way around one time. Um, so over the course of years, the stars don't appear to move that much. But over the course of hundreds or thousands of years, they do move. And constellations actually change shapes slightly. Um, now, uh, two or 3,000 years ago, um, the constellations were not that different, but they were measurably different enough that things like the North Star uh, was actually in a different place. So Polaris is the North Star right now. It's the closest star um, to geographic north, directly above the North Pole. Uh, but a thousand years ago, um, due to the movement of stars and also due to axial precession, which is sort of how the Earth wobbles, um, the stars kind of change shapes a little bit. One example, though, Eric, uh, about how stars change is the Pleiades star cluster, or the Seven Sisters. Now, it's nicknamed the Seven Sisters because traditionally, the human eye can see about six to seven stars in this little cluster. You'll see it above the moon tonight. And now, zooming in here, we can see um, that there are actually a few thousand stars in this cluster. Um, but even those with keen eyes today will probably only see six stars. Um, but back when this star cluster got its nickname, the, these stars were actually slightly in a different place. Um, so uh, they were actually, these two stars were far enough away that they looked like they were, uh, or they, they were more, uh, uh, you could see that they were separate more than they are today. So uh, I'm trying to find a little animation showing us, I saw an animation recently of this, um, but the, the stars in the Pleiades cluster are moving slightly, changing positions, and so, um, the, so thousands of years ago they were quite a bit different, and that's why Although the Pleiades cluster is nicknamed the Seven Sisters, it's much harder to see the seven distinct stars uh, in today's night sky. 
Uh, but that's a really great question, Eric. Thanks you for asking. Uh, Misty is asking, what time will Ursa Major and Ursa Minor be out? That's another good question, Misty. Um, so going back over to the north, um, we can see Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, or the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. Now, um, Misty, that is a great question because the answer is um, that they will always be out, at least here in Kansas City. So if we fast forward time again, you can see that as the Earth rotates around its axis, the stars appear to rotate around us. Now, they're rotating around a single point. That's the North Star, because the North Star is directly above the North Pole. But you can see there's a region of the sky that will always be up. Um, so these stars, like the stars in Cassiopeia and the stars in the Dippers, will always be above the horizon here in Kansas City. Um, and that's because they are what we call circumpolar. So as the sky spins around, or as the Earth spins around, they will always be visible. So Misty, uh, at least here in Kansas City, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor will always be out. Now, if you're in a different part of the world, further south, that is to say, um, they may not be out all the time. That's because the further south you go, um, the North Star will be lower in the sky. And as you can imagine, if the North Star is lower, then the Dippers and Ursa Major and Ursa Minor might be uh, setting and actually dipping out of sight. But they don't dip out of sight here in Kansas City. Uh, Smarl's asking, or saying that their six-year-old Sage is asking if you know about sunspots. Uh, Sage, I love talking about sunspots. Um, we don't have time to d dive in too deep, although I did do a show all about stars quite a long time ago, and you can find that on youtube.com slash kcplanetarium. Uh, but sunspots are regions on the sun um, that are really magnetically active. They're kind of like storms on the sun, um, and they look like spots because they're a little bit cooler um, but what's actually going on is that there's a lot of energy being uh, pulled out of those spots. And although we can't see it in different wavelengths of light, there are huge eruptions of energy coming from those spots because of the magnetic field. Um, so sunspots are super cool. And if you have proper uh, eyeglasses, you can get really cheap solar sunglasses that let you see things like eclipses. You can also see sunspots occasionally. Um, and uh, the sun also has seasons of weather. About every 12 years or so, it cycles between periods of higher activity and lower activity. Um, so right now, there aren't too many sunspots, but there will be more sunspots uh, over the next few years. But Sage, thanks for asking about that. All right, we're going to move right along. And um, I'm just going to briefly mention Orion the Hunter. It is our brightest constellation in the, in the sky and one of the most uh, vibrant uh, patterns in our winter skies. Um, but we're not going to dive too much in depth there. But I do want to point out that my favorite deep space object, the Orion Nebula, is inside of Orion. And we will fly there in 3D at our live planetarium star tour at the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium. So if you want to learn more about the Orion Nebula, uh, check out our live star tour. Um, now, what are other, some other things I wanted to touch on? I wanted to go over here to the east. Uh, there's a constellation called Leo that's starting to pop up in our spring skies. You can find it by looking for this. You can find it by looking for this pattern that looks like a backwards question mark or a coat hanger hook. This is like Leo's head or his mane. And there's his body and front paws and his tail. Um, there is Leo the lion. Uh, so uh, Leo has a star at the end of its tail named Denebola. That means tail of the lion in Arabic. And the nebula is the first star of the spring triangle. So the spring triangle is an uh, asterism, an unofficial star pattern that, w that tells us that spring is approaching. Um, now, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. Do I have the spring triangle on here? I don't believe so. That is okay. Um, but the... Denebola is the first star of the Spring Triangle, and if I fast forward a little bit here later in the evening, we'll see the other stars of the Spring Triangle. And those stars are Denebola with Leo, Arcturus with Bootes, and Spica with Virgo. Uh, and they form three bright stars that make a nice big triangle. And so as these stars rise earlier and earlier, we can tell that spring is approaching. And ancient people used to use this pattern to help them determine the changing seasons. So as soon as you see all three stars of the Spring Triangle up, that will tell you that spring is here and we're not quite there yet they will be rising after about 10 o'clock tonight um, but after sunset closer to 7 30 they have not quite yet risen but they're almost there checking into the comments uh it looks like sage says uh or sage says so cool and we will check out the youtube channel app awesome oh, well thank you so much for asking that amazing question sage 
And I hope you enjoy the rest of the, tonight's stream. Casey says it was my daughter's fifth birthday this weekend, and for her birthday, she wanted to go to the planetarium. So we came and we saw a Magic Treehouse show. Can we get a shout out for Sophia's fifth birthday? Absolutely, Sophia. Happy birthday. I hope it was out of this world, and I hope you enjoyed Magic Treehouse. So glad you came to the planetarium and wanted to share your birthday with us. And Sophia, I hope you have a wonderful week, uh, and thanks so much for watching tonight. And Misty says, I heard that when uh, Earth, uh, let's see, where Earth's axis will tilt, the North Star will move, and Vega will be in the North Star's place. Is that true? Misty, that is absolutely true. So as the Earth wobbles around every about 20,000 years or so, uh, the North Pole points at different places, and in about 12,000 years, the North Pole will be pointing towards the star Vega, and Vega will be the North Star for future humans, assuming we're around by then. All right, so um, now I've got a little mini deep dive planned today because one of my favorite deep space objects is inside of Leo. It's kind of behind Leo's back, actually. Now, it's um, so uh, so distant that we can't even see it in our virtual planetarium here. We're going to have to use the Hubble Space Telescope to see it. Um, and we can do that right now. Watch this. Woo, there's the Hubble. And we just zoomed in on this space behind Leo's back. And what we're looking at is the Cosmic Horseshoe. Now, this curved shape right here is the Cosmic Horseshoe. Uh, and now, to give you some context about this picture, we are so zoomed in that this bright dot here with this cross is the only star in this picture. Everything else you see is an entire galaxy, each containing billions of its own stars. So we're so zoomed in, but we can still see thousands of galaxies. Now, the cosmic horseshoe is this blue streak here. And what this actually is, is a spiral galaxy, just like the Milky Way galaxy. But spiral galaxies don't actually look like this. In fact, this blue galaxy shouldn't even be visible because this yellow galaxy, in reality, is right in front of it. So what are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing sort of a cosmic mirage. This streak here is due to the effects of gravitational lensing. And I wanted to talk a little bit about gravitational lensing with you all today. Um, so I'm going to jump in to, oops, don't want to do that. All right, so gravitational lensing. Now, what's happening in the cosmic horseshoe is that a big yellow galaxy, the, the, uh, the one inside of that streak we saw, is so massive and is so heavy that its gravity is bending the starlight from that blue galaxy behind it. And that light gets bent and distorted, warping around, and then we can see the distorted light rays from here on Earth. And that's what causes that horseshoe shape. Um, so this is a distortion uh, due to the effects of gravity. Um, now, uh, how do we know that gravity can or bend light? Well, we know thanks to pictures like the cosmic horseshoe, but we've actually known this before we had space telescopes. Um, uh, a famous person named Einstein uh, figured out through math that gravity could bend light. At least his math told him that he was pretty sure that it could bend light. And he developed these theories of what we call relativity in the early 1900s, around 1905 to 1915. Well, this was all theoretical, and we had no proof that Einstein was right. And a lot of scientists were skeptical if gravity could really bend light. Um, so uh, there were some scientists who decided that they wanted to test this. And it all started with somebody named Frank Dyson, who was the astronomer, astronomer royal and director of the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. And he decided to test these theories. Um, so he used uh, an event that was happening soon after Einstein published his theories, uh, it was a solar eclipse in 1919. And this is when the moon went in front of the sun. Um, they happen pretty frequently. The last one we saw here in North America was back in uh, 2017. Uh, it was pretty incredible. Um, but uh, there was an eclipse happening in 1919, and it was over the southern hemisphere. You can see the path of the eclipse here in this old diagram. Um, and what, uh, what was going to happen is that the moon would go in front of the sun and because of that, we'll, we would be able to see stars right next to the sun, which we normally can't see. Now, it just so happens that that eclipse in 1919 was uh, had the sun situated right near a rich star field inside uh, the Hades star cluster. Um, now, this uh, experiment was called the Eddington Experiment. Frank Dyson, along with another physicist named Arthur Eddington, developed this uh, experiment, and the aim of the expedition was to measure the gravitational deflection of starlight passing near the sun. The idea was that if we looked at a star um, during this eclipse near the sun, that it would appear in a slightly different place than it should be in the regular night sky. 
Um, and that was the theory. And if this was true, then it would prove Einstein right. It would prove that gravity could bend light. Um, so this, this total solar eclipse was on the 29th of May, 1919. And there were two expeditions, one to the Western African island of uh, Principe and the other to the Brazilian town of Sobral. Um, they wanted to test, to test this in two different places to verify their theory. Now they did that, they took photographs of, of that. Um, this is a picture of the, um, the Brazilian uh, photographic instruments. Pretty amazing that they could do this all the way back in 1919. And they did capture photographs. This is the real photograph um, of this eclipse back then. And they presented their results uh, to the Royal Society of London. And after some deliberation, the results were accepted. And basically what they found was that Einstein was right. The stars that appeared next to the sun during that eclipse were in a slightly different place than they should have been. And Einstein actually did the math to calculate this, and the math was pretty much spot on. Um, and it was pretty famous. Uh, and there was widespread newspaper coverage all over the world. This is the article from the New York Times at the time, uh, lights all askew in the heavens. Um, I just love how uh, crazy uh, headlines were back then. Uh, and then uh, Arthur Eddington even uh, made a little limerick at a Royal Society dinner um, about it, which uh, was kind of fun. But uh, uh, pretty cool that um, all the way back in 1919, we could photograph this same effect, gravitational lensing. And of course, today with technology like the Hubble Space Telescope, we can see that effect even more clearly in objects like the Cosmic Horseshoe. And there are many other examples of gravitational lensing. Um, and uh, today, gravitational lensing is a tool as well. Uh, sci scientists and astronomers who look for exoplanets, planets that are around other stars, they use a technique called gravitational microlensing to actually detect the existence of planets around stars by looking at slight perturbations uh, in light fields due to that gravitational effect. Um, so uh, again, this is called gravitational microlensing and it's used to detect exoplanets. Um, so that was my mini deep dive for today. Um, and I'm going to smile for the camera and make a crazy face for my thumbnail. <laughs> and um, we are going to continue tonight's stream. All right, everyone, how's everybody feeling? Are we still watching? Hopefully we've still got people tuning in. Remember, this is a live stream. So if you're watching, let us know uh, where you're watching from in the comments. And if you have any questions, we had some amazing questions earlier. Alinda says, what's the latest news on Beetlejuice? And we, uh, where do we look for it? Uh, also, happy birthday, Sophia, Linda says. Um, be, uh, Linda was asking about the star Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice is the bright red star in the upper left-hand corner of Orion. Um, and as far as the news, at the very beginning of our live streams two years ago, Betelgeuse was getting dimmer, and some sort of scientists thought that it may be going supernova, but it got a lot brighter, uh, and it, now it's been pretty stable in its brightness, so we think that maybe it was a dust cloud or something that went in front of it, and that's why it got dim. So the latest news is that Betelgeuse is still there, Linda, still shining brightly, and uh-oh, did I say Betelgeuse three times? Um... <laughs> Nana says, hi, from St. Louis, and Lance says, winter's not my favorite, but I love to see the constellation Orion arriving with the season. Lance, I share your sentiment exactly, actually. Um, winter is my favorite stargazing season, and it is my least favorite weather season. I'm a summer person for sure, but Orion is my favorite constellation, and the Orion Nebula this is one of the things I love looking at the most through a telescope. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, just have to deal with it. All right, everybody. So we are going to uh, wrap up our tour by talking about some astronomy news updates. So stay tuned uh, and don't turn that dial. Uh, don't touch that dial because we are going to start out with everyone's favorite segment, Web Watch. What's going on with the James Webb Space Telescope? And what is going on is a lot of cool stuff. Um, in fact, uh, the past month has been a lot of really exciting updates for the Webb Space Telescope. Um, and uh, there are a lot of big milestones that have been hit over the past month. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, I'm spacing out because I just realized I'm not recording tonight's stream. Uh, that's okay. We'll pull uh, the the VOD from Facebook. Whoops. No worries. All right. So um, <laughs> James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so uh, last month, uh, Webb opened its wings, so to speak, opening its primary mirror. And this month, it opens its eyes. It's a very poetic thing that uh, scientists said about it. All right, so far, um, uh, James, Webb, James Webb Space Telescope has been aligning on the star HD 84406, which we can find um, using Stellarium, maybe. 
Uh, let's see. I believe we have a search function somewhere. Let's see. We've got HD uh, 84406. And ooh, there it is. Oh, it's been aligning on that star in Ursa Major. So the Webb Space Telescope is right now pointing at um, this star sort of in the shoulder of the bear. It's a very dim, faint and dim star, apparently, because I can't even see it in Stellarium. Hello? Is there a star there? Uh, well, it's apparently there, um, but <laughs> we can hardly see it. But the James Webb Space Telescope can see it, uh, and it's been starting to take pictures. Now, this is a selfie that the Webb Space Telescope captured uh, using its uh, near-infrared camera, known as NearCam. Uh, this tool was chosen uh, owing to its wide field of view, and because it's capable of working at uh, higher temperatures uh, than Webb's other instruments, which are still cooling down. And early signs are that everything is working pretty well with the uh, Webb Space Telescope, um, uh, with all the pieces. So it did take that study of its mirrors. Uh, but more interestingly, um, the Webb Telescope has been aligning. So this is this initial alignment mosaic. So the mirrors were a little bit wobbly and out of alignment, although scientists say that they looked pretty good uh, considering all the effects that the launch had on the Webb Space Telescope. Um, these are the different mirror segments out of the 18 hexagonal mirrors. Um, and kind of where they're pointing. So they're all sort of wonky and out of the way, but we needed to identify them, first of all. Um, and then, then and, uh, this happened um, back in uh, February 11th. I took this initial, initial alignment picture, um, and uh, there's that selfie. And so uh, on February 18th, it had already uh, calibrated the mirrors um, to match the array. So this is the next picture taken on February 18th. Um, this was uh, the, a process called segment image identification. Uh, the dots are oriented in a hexagonal formation and the team uh, completed this, which um, basically uh, they correct large position errors, um, sort of like giving each mirror a pair of glasses. Um, and so after this, they need to stack up all of these images together. And by February 25th, that stacking was successful. So um, here is that uh, the initial alignment, and then when they were all stacked together, uh, it was just one star. Now, this star is still a little blurry and out of focus, but the ultimate goal is to get the mirrors to match each other uh, to uh, about 50 nanometers, or 50 billionths of a meter. Um, so there's a lot of accuracy involved with this, and there's still a little bit of time left to finish getting everything aligned. Um, so basically, uh, the image stacking put all the light uh, from a star in one place, um, but uh, each of the mirrors, mirror segments are still acting like 18 small telescopes rather than one big one. So the segments now need to be lined up with each other with an accuracy smaller than the wavelength of the light that they're capturing. Um, so the team is now starting its fourth phase of mirror alignment, known as coarse phasing, where the near cam is used to capture light spectra from 20 separate pairings of mirror segments. This helps the team identify and correct vertical displacement between the mirror segments or small differences in their heights. And this will make single dot of starlight progressively sharper and more focused in the coming weeks. Um, so uh, pretty soon we'll have an even clearer image, and in the next few months we'll be getting real science from the Webb Space Telescope. All right, checking into the comments. Lance says, uh, good grief, I love the science. If I had just one ounce of Einstein's brain, maybe I could have been somebody, <laughs> LOL. You're still somebody to me, Lance. Um, Einstein was a different person altogether. Um, so we'll let him do those crazy science stuff. I'm happy. I'm happy you just being me and I'm happy that you're just being you. Casey says, how excited are you for the, how excited are you for the James Webb Telescope start sharing pictures on a scale of one to 10? Uh, I am uh, excited on, uh, uh, I would say, 18 out of 10 uh, because of the 18 mirror segments. No, I'm really excited, Casey. I can't wait for it to start taking pictures. Um, it's going to be pretty incredible. Uh, Corey says, have they figured out whose space junk crashed into the moon? Corey, uh, they did. I didn't uh, plan on talking about this tonight, but um, there was talk of uh, some debris that's going to crash into the moon. Initially, it was thought that it was a SpaceX segment um, from a, a spent booster, but actually we found out it was a Chinese rocket. Uh, so um, that is the space junk crash into the moon. Uh, and Eric says, where is Phoebe? I don't know if you heard, but she just announced that she would like to be a part of the stream. Um, so you know what? Uh, we're getting close to... Oh, yeah, she really wants to be part of the stream. Um, I don't know if I want to uh, uh, reward that behavior, but if she's quiet for a little while longer, maybe I'll go grab her. 
Misty says, I heard that NASA is sending a rocket called Artemis. Do you know when it's launching? I do, Misty. And that is my next news segment, so stay tuned. And Hannah says, where can I go to learn about planets? Uh, and, well, you can go to the planetarium for sure, uh, the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium at Union Station. I'm the planetarium manager there, and you can watch uh, a lot of different documentary features about our universe uh, and our live star tour, Sky Station Live. We dive into what's up in our night sky, and that often includes planets, although right now there aren't any visible in the early evening. Come back in the summer. Hopefully we'll see some planets then. Uh, but, Misty, stay tuned. We're going to talk about Artemis in just a minute. Um, but uh, let's see if maybe Phoebe wants to join us. Uh, so if you all want to stand by, um, we will be right All right, we are back, everyone. We've got Phoebe here, uh, who is tuning in for tonight's stream. Let's see if uh, whoop, that's not right. There we go. Um, uh, oh, that's all right. You're gonna be a little overblown, Phoebe. That's okay. Say hello, Phoebe. Give me kisses. The bird. All right, Phoebe's gonna tune in for the uh, wrapping up our stream. A couple more news pieces to check out. Um, Here's a, a bit of crazy news that happened. Um, there was a geomagnetic storm that destroyed 40 SpaceX Starlink satellites. Hop up there, Phoebe. Um, actually, you're probably going to poop in a second. Um, so uh, here is a little video uh, showing these satellites exploding. Um, so this batch of Starlink satellites took off from the Kennedy Space Center on Thursday, February 3rd, atop of a Falcon 9 rocket. All 49 satellites reached their intended preliminary um, orbits some 130 miles above the surface, and each achieved controlled flight, but they attempted to rise towards their operational altitude, uh, but the universe had other plans. Uh, so what happened is there was a geomagnetic storm that caused the atmosphere to warm, and the atmospheric density at um, the low satellite deployment at altitudes increased. And basically what happened is the air got thicker, and the satellites were not able to rise to the point that they needed to to escape the Earth's gravity and so they crashed back down to Earth. Uh, but deorbiting satellites, uh, Starlink satellites, poses zero risk uh, colliding with other satellites or um, hurting the ground. Now, these satellites are actually designed to disintegrate before they hit the ground, just in case there's ever an issue and they need to be deorbited. They each weigh approximately 500 pounds, so they're actually fairly light for a satellite. Um, to date, SpaceX has launched over 2,000 satellites to low Earth orbit. Uh, forming uh, an interconnected network that provides broadband internet to paying customers on the surface. All right, Misty, so let's talk about Artemis, and we've got an Artemis update for you. Uh, let's see here. Um, the thing I wanted. So, a press release from NASA. Oh, thank you, Phoebe. Um, so... Uh, they have been testing the Artemis rocket, which is the rocket that will eventually take astronauts back to the moon. Um, and uh, right now there is a scheduled launch happening soon that will test out this rocket. It will be un uh, But a, west, a wet dress rehearsal appears uh, to be closer than ever since a series of tests have just been completed on the four RS-25 engine flight controllers, according to NASA. So in December of last year, one of these flight controllers began to misbehave. Um, but the replacement unit... No. Okay, there goes Phoebe. Um, come back here, bird. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, there was a misbehaving flight controller. Uh, but they replaced it, and uh, the problem has seemed has seemed to be resolved. And NASA can now focus on the final closeouts as it prepares for its inaugural launch of this 332-foot-tall rocket, known as the, as the Artemis One. So, um, the Artemis II mission will uh, schedule to take place in 2024, and that will be a crewed mission to fly around the moon. And then in 2025, we're currently scheduled to land on the moon. So the next steps include pre-flight diagnostics and final hardware closeouts, such as tests with the flight termination system and last minute installations on the two solid rocket boosters. Now the current launch uh, has been pushed back to May, 
It's been pushed back a number of times, and currently it is scheduled for May. The launch window is May 7th through the 21st. If Artemis 1 is not ready to go by then, um, then the next window is June 6th through 16th. And after that, we've got another window from June 29th through July 12th. But uh, we will be crossing our fingers and toes that we will make one of those launch windows sooner rather than later. All right. Uh, Bob and Bruce are watching live from Des Moines. Hi, Bob and Bruce. Thanks so much for tuning in. And Phoebe says hi as well. Uh, and Emily says, fun fact, Einstein had ADHD. That is a good fact, Emily. Um, and that's really interesting. So uh, there you go. A little bit of solidarity for anybody out there uh, who uh, shares that with Einstein. Einstein is a pretty smart guy and did some pretty amazing things. Hannah says, hello, Phoebe. Misty says, hi, Phoebe. Hi, Phoebe. Can you say hi, Phoebe? Can you say... Oops, she's getting very blown out. Uh, let's lower the brightness. Phoebe, can you say scratch? Scratch. Phoebe, can you say scratch? Oh, she almost did it. Scratch. Scratch. Come on. Scratch. Scratch. Of course, she's not going to perform. Maybe if we do her trick. Phoebe, scratch. 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 He doesn't like that. Okay, Phoebe, okay. All right. Well, Phoebe says hi, everybody. Uh, Nancy says, your favorite place to watch meteor showers from the KC area, other than the Powell Observatory. Uh, Nancy, um, uh, let's see. I've got a couple favorite places, actually. Um, and let's see if I can um, pull them up. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Where are my places? Places, places. Your places. Here we go. Uh, do, 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 dark sky. All right, here we go. Well, actually, I'm not going to show this map because it has my address on it. <laughs> um, uh, but um, there are a couple good places uh, if you want to, or if you're looking east. Um, I've gone up to the town of Bremer, which is in a nice spot away from a lot of light pollution. There's also the Annie and Abel uh, Van Meter State Park uh, and Settles Forward Conservation Area. On the Kansas side, um, I often go down to close to Eureka, Kansas, um, and that's a pretty good spot far away from a lot of light pollution. Um, so a couple different, a couple good places nearby. Uh, I would also just encourage you to look for a uh, light pollution map, a dark sky map. Um, that you can, if you just Google dark sky map, you can find a lot of good spots. It'll show you a map of light pollution near cities. Scratch. Scratch. You can, you're not going to say that. BB. Scratch. I know you give me kisses. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, Corey says, regarding SpaceX satellites, considering how much man-made stuff is up there, will this become a common occurrence? Are geomagnetic storms increasing? Um, uh, geomagnetic storms, I don't believe, are increasing, uh, Corey, but I'm not totally sure about that. Um, those are just due to regular sort of convection activity inside the Earth's core. And although humans are doing a lot of things to affect uh, things on the Earth, like our atmosphere, um, so far we are not able to affect things happening within the Earth's core. Uh, never say never. I'm sure we'll figure out a way. Taylor says, oh my gosh, I didn't know you were broadcasting today. Never got a notification. Sorry, Taylor, we were having some technical difficulties. But don't worry, we'll have a recording of our stream up uh, for you to re-watch. Uh, hopefully in decent quality. Maybe Facebook will let me download a higher quality version, but um, hopefully not. I forgot to record before. But don't worry, Case or Taylor, we will have uh, something for you to watch for sure. All right, um, and let's see... Uh, I'm going to finish things out with, uh, oh, um, a couple little last second items. Uh, it was Perseverance one year anniversary of landing on the red planet on Mars. Uh, it landed on February 18th last year. We did a whole live stream special about it. Go to youtube.com slash KC Planetarium uh, to uh, watch that if you want to relive that excitement where we followed along with that uh, exciting landing. Um, an update about Perseverance. Uh, there is... Uh, a rock currently stuck in the wheel of perseverance. Um, it, uh, this picture was taken on February 25th. Um, this uh, stone is, is now apparently a, a stubborn fixture in the $2.2 billion rover. No one knows when the rock managed to hop aboard, um, but it appears to be a cosmetic annoyance, so hopefully it won't uh, affect the rover's progress. The rover's wheels are designed to deal with rocks that get stuck in them. 
Uh, but nonetheless, there is a hitchhiker on the Perseverance Mars rover. Uh, speaking of Mars rovers, a bit of unfortunate news, but uh, the uh, European Space Agency has issued a statement uh, saying that uh, the ExoMars rover uh, is unlikely to launch in 2022 as it was originally planned. Um, this is due to uh, ongoing um, things that are happening over in uh, the Eastern European region. Um, so again, that rover was uh, originally a, a joint operation between between space agency and Russia, but um, there are uh, they're not planning on doing that anytime soon. Uh, this rover was intended to search for organic molecules or even signs of life on the red planet. It was expected to launch this fall and land on Mars sometime in 2023, or would have joined NASA's two rovers and another rover launched by China already operating on the planet. But unfortunately, the recent military action. Um, by Russia and the ensuing international sanctions have now made this timeline a pipe dream. Um, so just a couple uh, recaps and uh, the final thing I'll say uh, about that. Uh, so the situation with Ukraine, um, uh, people may be wondering what's happening aboard the International Space Station since there are astronauts, American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts aboard there. But NASA has made it clear that um, the science will continue aboard the International Space Stations and the astronauts and cosmonauts will continue to cooperate with each other. Um, there has been a lot of propaganda um, out from Russia about breaking apart or even destroying the International Space Station, but these are all intimidation tactics, and the ISS will continue to soldier on up there, so don't worry about that. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to, I brought this up a few times, but it's one of my favorite things to talk about, and that is uh, the pale blue dot. Um, this is a picture of the Earth taken by the Voyager space probe. Um, just minutes before the Voyager 1's cameras were intentionally powered off to conserve power, um, this was uh, picture was taken on February 14th, 1990, just before I was born. And this is a picture of the Earth from uh, billions of miles away, just a tiny pale dot uh, suspended in a sunbeam. Uh, and Carl Sagan, uh, who was a famous uh, astronomer and cosmologist and science communicator, uh, had some things to say about the pale blue dot. Um, and uh, I wanted to close out on that. So let me just touch in uh, the comments for, but first before I do that, uh, Paul, uh, it says, uh, talking about Phoebe, uh, Phoebe not saying scratch, you have to feed me first. That is true. In fact, she's snacking on some uh, treats right now. Um, we'll get her to say scratch another time. Uh, Taylor says, do you have an Instagram or Twitter? Uh, Taylor, we don't really. Um, that is social media that we have not jumped on yet, but hopefully sometime soon we will. Um, Union Station does have both of those accounts and Science City as well, so check those out. Science City, we've been posting a lot more on there, and maybe we'll post some Planetarium content. But we do have a Facebook page, planetarium.com, or facebook.com slash KC Planetarium, and our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. And one last question from Misty. With all the space junk crashing into the Earth and Moon, with all the countries making spacecraft and satellites, will Earth ever have a big uh, piece of space junk? There is a decent amount of space junk up there, Misty, but luckily we are tracking a lot of the big pieces that we could be worried about. So hopefully um, that won't be a problem, and there are efforts underway to clean up some of the space junk too. So stay tuned for that. But anyway, I just wanted to end on uh, a, a, just a, a little, a, a few words that Carl Sagan shared about this picture of the Earth. So again, this picture of the Earth from a billion miles away from the Voyager space probe. And Carl says, quote, look at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and for forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, full child, inventor, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitant of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings, how, e how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, 
The delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there's no hint that help will come from ever, uh, elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor, harbor life. There's nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Sure. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for this moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It's been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There's perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. That's Carl Sagan reflecting on this picture of the Earth from a billion miles away. Well, everyone, we're going to wrap up tonight's stream. Hannah is asking, how much does it cost to go to the Planetarium? Hannah, tickets are $8. Uh, you get free passes with the Union Station membership bell. And Paul is asking, will we be on each week or by schedule now? Uh, Paul, we're going to continue our monthly streams on the first Monday of every month or where we go over what's up in our night sky and what's been going on in the world of astronomy over the past month. Um, and so be sure to check that out, Paul, and Misty's asking the same thing. Um, but for now, we're going to wrap up tonight's stream. I've been your planetary manager, Pat Hess. Thank you again to our supporting sponsor, MRI Global, for their support of the planetarium and our programs and everything going on at Union Station. And thank you all for watching. Be sure to check out recordings of our other streams at youtube.com slash kcplanetarium. If you're watching on uh, the Union Station Facebook page, head over to facebook.com slash kcplanetarium and be sure to like and subscribe to the planetarium there. Uh, Angela says, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Angela. And thank you to everyone else who watched tonight. Hope you enjoyed tonight's stream. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the month. Casey uh, says, Sophia was elated uh, that you said happy birthday. Well, happy birthday again, Sophia. Thanks, Patrick, Union Station. And thank you, Casey, and to all of our watchers. We will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye, Misty. Thanks for watching. Bye, everybody. And Nancy as well. Thank you all. Thank you so much for all of your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good night, everybody.